Greetings. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We're here. A little wor rough, worse for the wear, as they say. You would think it taken almost a month and a half off. Uh, would We'd come back refreshed and smiling and shiny and all that. Um, so I got, I, got, I, got a, I got a corny joke to start off with. Came to me this morning. Might even be an original. All right. I'll ask Brendan. Why don't they paint restroom doors kind of like a light rose color? I have no idea why. It would always look flush. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joel, let's get started with the program. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hopefully I didn't mess anything. I'm having to reset something here real quick. There we go. Okay, that was to buy us an extra minute. Yeah, John chapter 8, verse 25. Uh, Jimmy asks that in the chat room. All right, so let's go ahead and let's pick up in verse 21. So kind of as recapping this, when you go back to verse 13, we have Jesus. Um, he's kind of defending, if you would, his self, his, him bearing witness of himself. Uh, going back there to verse 14. He says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I'm going, came from and where I'm going. So we have that context there. Um, and then beginning in verse 21, we have Jesus uh, saying, um, he tells him that he is going away. And let me bring that up on the screen here real quick. Boy, I'm handicapped this morning, guys. Um, very slowly handicapped. So then he says, I'm going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And of course, we know who he's talking uh, to here. We've looked at this. Um, Brandon, this was not saying the Jews, any Jew could not be saved. Even the leaders of the Pharisees themselves, it's not saying they could not be saved. But kind of what is the idea there in the section there of 21 through 24? Hey, I got, give me a minute, but I got re miscombobulated, so <laughs> it's one of those mornings, right? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I probably probably should have just read this again. It's been almost two months. It's been uh, almost yes. two months. <laughs> I tell you what, Brendan, would you like to read 21 through 24 sure. for us? Let's do, that's more my speed right now. <laughs> All right, John chapter 8, 21 through 24. Then Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Okay. So he wasn't telling the Jews they themselves could not be saved, was he? No. And uh, I, I think you, I think you see that um, in his explanation to their, their wrong conclusion or his answer to their wrong conclusion in verse 23, you are from beneath, I'm from above. And I think there's another lesson to be learned here about the teaching style of Jesus. Um, you know, we don't see Jesus, per se, going to the ends of the earth, chasing down a person who doesn't want to learn, who's not interested. Malava's teaching, the parables, the Beatitudes, um, he just throws it out there. And for the people who kind of throw up their hands in the air and say, eh, this is nonsense, Jesus doesn't chase him down. But for those few people that says, you know, what did you mean by that? Um or I want to hear more about that. Those are the people Jesus really spent the time for. And you look at who the people he's talking to here, uh, the Jews here, they're, they're not even even entertained the idea that this might be a spiritual discussion. They think he's, they're talking about suicide. He's talking about suicide there in verse uh, 20, 22. But in verse 24, this is why he says they'll die in their sins. Because if they do not believe that he is, 
you'll die in your sins. Now, New King James has he there in italics. Mm -hmm. Uh a little side point. This is a really good verse, but sometimes our Muslim friends or others will say, well, where did Jesus ever say he was God? This is one of those verses. Jesus is saying, I am. He's he's using the same description of, descriptor of himself that God does in Exodus when he's speaking to Moses. Well, Moses goes, well, what name shall I call you? And he goes, I am who I am, the, the self-existent one. And Jesus is using that same descriptor or same title or name here as well. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Um, and so until they're willing to recognize or even entertain the thought that Jesus actually is God, he is the Christ, the anointed one, uh, they're going to die in their sins because that's the first step. That's the first thing you have to agree to in order to be safe from your sins that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Um, so those are my thoughts there. Okay. All right. Good point. Good point. Well, then let's go ahead and pick up with 25. Um, Paul, would you mind uh, reading beginning in verse 25? And let's read through. Let's go to just a couple verses through verse 27. And let's kind of look at their their reply. Okay. <clears throat> John 8, 25 uh, in the New King James Version. The scripture says, uh, Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul there. So that was their question. Who are you? They didn't, and like what Brendan said, they didn't catch the reference when he said, I am. Okay. They didn't, they're not understanding what he's saying here, but he goes back to the answer of the question or his answer goes back to what he's already been telling them. Um, but verse six there, notice what he says. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the word, those things, which I heard from him, Paul fundamentally Jesus continues, even through the course of his whole, just about his whole ministry, if not his whole ministry, to keep giving credit to whom? To the Father. Yeah. yeah. That he came to do the will of his Father. The words that he spoke were the words of the Father. Uh, and that that's what it was all about, was what the Father sent him to do to complete that. So, Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Tom, you got a thought? Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I've been actually preaching on uh, authority lately, establishing the need for Bible study. And and I see in this text something interesting. You know, why didn't Jesus just come out and say, you know, uh, I am God. You know, I, I, I am part of the Godhead and, and referring to the Father and so on. It's kind of interesting that Jesus expected them to reach the conclusions based on the evidence and you find that all throughout john and you find that all throughout scriptures jesus wants people to think <laughs> and, and and reach a conclusion you know when you reach a conclusion on your own rather than just hearing something outright um, it usually has more meaning you know from that standpoint you mm -hmm. know you know it, it, which is why we talk about the bible as principles you know, so, so much of what we learn from the Bible is principles. Even though it was written 2,000 years ago, there are principles that we can apply today. And, and that's what Jesus is doing with them. So you've had the law. Study the law. Uh, I have told you things. If you would just put them in their proper context, you know that I'm telling you the truth. And you look at the things that I'm doing, you know that I'm telling you the truth. We've talked about these witnesses already in the book of John. Yeah. That's a good point. All right, any other thoughts on that? Okay. So let's go forward then. From ver as Paul's already read in verse 27, of course, they did not understand what he was saying. And here's the thing. This is not part, this is not uncommon. It's not even uncommon today. Um, we understand why Jesus wrote in, uh, parables, but yet... Look at how frequently the parables are, for lack of a better term, misunderstood, misinterpreted, uh, wrong meanings assigned to them, and so forth. 
um, a lot is going to have to do with the individual and their hearing of the word and whether or not they're going to set their hearts and their minds on the word. Um, I'm going to try not to some, I don't try not to rant too much, but fundamentally, and I think this would apply in any area of your life, whether you're talking about religious matters, you're talking about politics, whatever, you are influenced and programmed by the things that you hear. All right. And so depending on what source of information you listen to, you may be all for this person and completely against that person. And same thing, biblical teaching. A lot will depend on what you have been raised as, if you've been raised within some sort of religious belief, what you've been taught and things of that nature. And what we have to do is learn to step beyond the things that have influenced us. We need to look through and listen to the whole of the story, the whole of the picture that is being presented there. The Jews, all right, the, the Jewish leaders were blind to the very things that Jesus was saying because their influence level, their programming, if you would, did not allow for there to be any other different thing for them to accept. And so we have to make certain. Here's a very case in point to where he's talking to them about the Father. They don't understand that. They don't get that. And we could do the same thing today. Read something. And, and we, we look at it in hindsight and say, well, we've got the whole story. So all this should make sense to us, but sometimes it doesn't. We have to be willing to listen to everything and give consideration, look past what the local preacher tells us, look past what our parents tell us, and let the Bible define itself. And then if it is what we've always been taught, great. But if it's not what we've always been taught, then we need to be, be different than these Jewish leaders here who were unwilling to relearn, if you would. Um, any thoughts or any comments? Brendan? There we go. I got the mute off. Well, well, to that point, John, you know, that's, that's true in, on everything. You know, as a Christian, we have to be willing to re-examine, re-study, re-learn. Because uh, there's, there's always something new. There's a new element. There's a new depth that we can plunge to in, in our study of God's Word. I, I never want to get to a point where I say, well, I know everything there is to know about baptism. Uh, because the truth is, I don't. There's there's probably more connections in the Bible than I know there is. Um, or, you know, some. I was talking on this last night in our midweek talk. Sometimes, you know, we hear a gospel meeting get announced and the topics are in defense of baptism, the New Testament church, Bible authority. And sometimes our response is, well, I don't need to go. I've already heard those lessons. I don't you know, I already know what he's going to say. That might be true. I almost guarantee everyone listening uh, that you don't know what he's going to say. And there's something new to be learned, a new appreciation for maybe the old truths that we, we, we do know. You know, Peter, one of the last things he wrote was, so long as I'm in this early tabernacle, I will stir you up by way of reminder. Not, you know, he's writing these things, not because they didn't know them, but because they did know them. And that still meant that they needed to learn and still listen and re-examine and re-study. Um, and to that same point, you know, new is not always better. Uh, I, I've been rediscovering the writings of R.L. Whiteside recently and Guy in Woods and, and H. Leo Bowles, guys from 1890s, early 1900s. And I have just been impressed with the depth of knowledge, their perspective on things, and I've been really encouraged by their writings as far as I'm studying Romans and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, uh, sometimes we, we get chronological snobbery, as C.S. Lewis talked about, and say, well, they have nothing to teach us. Well, no, they do. I just have to be willing to be humble enough to say, you know, I can learn something from this. Even a bad book can teach me something. Uh, maybe what not to do, but I can learn from anything if I'm willing and humble enough to reexamine and think and be willing to have the attitude of, hey, I can learn something here. I think that's an excellent point. Um, when I first moved here in a book I'd never heard about, but one of the elders at the time back in 07 asked me if I had Milligan's The Scheme of Redemption. And I said, no. He says, you're a preacher and you don't have Milligan's Scheme of the Redemption? Every preacher has that. And um, it's one of those older style written books where it's a little harder to read. Um, 
but I don't agree with everything that he says, oh. but um, it's, it's interesting. He makes the point, I think it's Milligan's, I'd have to go back and double check it, and way off topic here, but in Abraham, um, in Genesis 15, where Abraham has the vision, and remember, he, he lays down the sacrifice, and nothing happens, and nothing happens. And then finally, after the vision, the Lord comes and takes up. He reads into that a little bit more and says that God was showing Abraham because of his lack of faith. And I thought that was a good point. There were a few instances his faith was not as strong as it should be. It would be later, of course. Um, but he says that God was rejecting his sacrifice for a time. And I, and I don't know if I would read into that so much that. But the point is, though, aside from that, he has a lot of very good points that if you don't study the mindset of older preachers, they're not always right, but you always have nuggets in there that could be helpful in learning more about yeah. scriptures. Well, yeah. again, we're on a rabbit hole here, but uh, a recent book, uh, eBay has been awful for me because I can find out of print books written by a brethren that can't get anymore. And I got questions and answers by a guy in was at the open forum. You know, pretty thick. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And, um, the author, the seller didn't know what they had because it's signed by Guy and Woods. I don't think they realized that. Um, but I was just reading his answers to questions on books he would recommend for preachers. Uh, ideas about, hey, does preaching have enough, as much emphasis as it needs to today? And very astute, very good recommendations. A lot of his answers on, on the Holy Spirit were very good. And again... This is, I don't agree with everything in here, yeah. but, you know, there's, there's a lot to be learned from preachers of the past, Christians of the past. There's a lot to be learned in the present. Um, and, you know, kind of tying this back to John 8, one of the big problems that many of the religious leaders, I would say most of them, there was a few exceptions, but a lot of them had was they thought they had arrived at a perfect understanding of God's truth. And that precluded them from even considering that they might be wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, think of the Sanhedrin interaction with Nicodemus and others where the Sanhedrin, by and large, just scoffs at the idea that the Messiah is going to come from Galilee. Um, you know, we even see that with early, earlier in the Gospel of John, two of the early disciples go, can anything good come from Nazareth? They just wasn't in their minds. We, well, everybody knows that's not going to happen. And that, that precluded them from even considering that they might be wrong on something or that there's something to be learned here. And when we adopt that mindset, I would say that's, that's, a, that's a big telltale sign of spiritual stagnation, if not the beginning of spiritual decay. Because uh, yeah. I, I should be willing and, and able to listen and study. Because guess what? Truth is going to be truth, and truth is always right, and truth has nothing to hide. Uh, and I, I remind of a quote from R.L. Whiteside. I was reading the other day, and I'll just leave it there. Um, ignorance is often very dogmatic. <laughs> yeah, you you know, and and you know, and you talk about the Pharisees as we're dealing with in this text. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one of the things that was condemned by the Pharisees. You know, if you do a study of the Pharisees, uh, th there are some things about them that are not condemned we could really learn from them, you know, um, but this type of an attitude is what is condemned. And that's a point to give consideration to, um, you know, uh, tying it to today. Uh, do we really allow others to question, you know, to, to question something, you know, they're studying it. And like, uh, you know, we, we render lip service to being open-minded but if somebody dares to think different than us, uh, we don't let them think different without consequences. And that, uh, and and obviously, we're not saying set aside the truth. You know, truth right. is uh, the whole point is truth is truth. But uh, th there are areas where I, I, like Brendan said, I think we've gotten so dogmatic that we won't allow anybody that if, if they don't fall right in line with us on every point, uh, 
uh, every, every thought on a specific subject, then we're going to we're going to label them, and and uh, you know we're going to mark them, and, and those types of things. That's what the Pharisees are doing, and that's a part of what the Pharisees are doing that was condemned by Jesus. Yeah. Well, well, to that point, Tom, just an illustration of that, you know, I was working through Farrell's Jenkins, uh, the finger of God study on the Holy Spirit the other day. And something I appreciate about Farrell um, on his position on the indwelling, he, ma he made a really good point. He says, no preacher, no Bible student he's ever met, same with me, has ever denied the spirit indwells in the Christian. That That's 100% affirmed in Scripture. Where we differ is how. Uh, is it a literal indwelling? Is it a figurative? Uh, and Whiteside again had some good comments. The Bible never explains how. So you can take a position on that. Uh, the issue comes where are you going to be dogmatic about that position on something that the Bible really does not spell out for us on how the Spirit indwells. The Bible simply affirms that the Spirit does indwell. And we can look at some things on, on the effects of that and, and what he does for us. Uh, but Again, you know, we're, um, you know, we got to be careful about that. And it's not that there aren't things we can, we have to draw lines on. There are, but we have to be careful. We have to think through these things and we have to allow, I think, really room for people to grow. Uh, one of the biggest uh, compliments I think a, a preacher or a Bible student, a Bible teacher can give a student, uh, especially a new convert. I look forward to the day when new converts start to disagree with me. And I don't mean that like factiously, but there comes a time where, you know, if I convert somebody, they take everything I say as gospel truth, more or less. You know, I, I'm the teacher that so forth, but they get to a point, their spiritual development where they start thinking on their own and they start drawing some different conclusions. And as long as those conclusions aren't, you know, denying poor doctrine, um, you know, say on the Holy Spirit, somebody uh, on my study, I've, I've come, I've come to an understanding differently than you. I'm like, that's great. Let's talk about that. And let's, let's have a discussion about that. To me, that's a great day because that shows me that new convert has grown enough spiritually that they don't need somebody else to feed them now. They're feeding themselves. <clears throat> well, Today's the happiest day because we all will disagree with you on what you just said. No. <laughs> and, you know, I think, and this isn't a study to kind of talk about that, but I think, that, I think that's a good point. The only thing that in any position that I take in the scriptures, I just have to make certain that my position that I'm going to stand on doesn't contradict somewhere else in the scriptures or doesn't bring in some other teaching that doesn't, that, that the scriptures clearly would contradict. Um, but the point is, we are not all at the same level of understanding or on the same page. We should be in most everything. But there are some more meteor things. Even Peter. I mean, if one of the apostles could write about another apostle, that this apostle has written things that are somewhat difficult to understand, then that kind of tells us there that in our studies, there will be times and subject matters mm -hmm. that we will be perplexed and might disagree with one another regarding um you remember who said about that about whom <laughs> peter about paul you know and i don't know if peter was commenting it from the position of the readers of the paul's letters or maybe even from his own observation you know i'm guessing a little bit at that so all right let's see caleb um and i won't be able to bring caleb's comment in something has gone wonky over here. But Caleb said this. He said, you might have heard that lesson. Now, this goes back to, Brandon, what you're talking about, hearing other preachers' lessons and everything. And we don't always, um, you know, it helps us to grow when we do. He says, you might have heard that lesson, but how well can you recall in the time of need? You know, hence the need to continue to hear, you know, lessons over and over again. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Any other thoughts or comments? Let's go ahead and continue now with verse 28 of John chapter 8. And Tom, if you would, start in verse 28 and let's read through verse 30, please. So, uh, so John, uh, John 8, 28. Uh, 
Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Okay. Mr. Tom, when we go back to the, uh, let's see where I need to be right there. There we go. Um, when in, in the comment here, is he talking about his death? When he says, when you lift up the son of man, you'll know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. Not just his yes. death, but I guess what would follow, but. Yeah, he's, he's, he's mentioning his death, but it's not just the fact that he died. He's also mentioning that he's going to be raised from the dead because it is the resurrection that promotes, that promotes that belief and, and establishes who he is. But he's tying this to the fact that he's going to die. And, and this is just one of those occasions based upon everything else we read in John and other Gospels. Uh, I believe that John is, is indicting them. As in, as in saying, notice he says, when you lift up the Son of Man, when, when you see to it that I'm crucified, uh, you think you're going to have won. But you're going to know that the claims I am making are true. And you're going to see that on the third day. Okay. Well, then let me throw this question out. All right. Um, and Tom, I'll ask this to you, but Paul and, and Brendan, feel free to chime in as well, especially if you disagree with Tom. Um, but <laughs> so Jesus' statement here um, sounds like he's telling them that, and, and, and Tom made this made the point very well, that they may think that they won, but of course they did not. All right. And they would not. And he says, the father has not left me alone for I always do those things that please him. Do you think that verse should have a direct bearing on the way that we view his statement on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, there's other reasons to look at that passage differently than what many people do. But would this statement by Jesus have any bearing on that? Uh, I have got a picture of a can of worms. No. I do. I actually have a can of worms that, yeah. that one of our members brought to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but 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 uh, having said that, um, yes, I think it has a bearing on that, and it has a bearing on it in the way that uh, that David was saying that, and 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 I've I've got my views about Jesus on the cross, you know. I do not believe that Jesus was abandoned by God. I don't think God ever turned his back on Jesus. I agree with that. And the reason why is because I've read Psalm 22. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, that's the bottom line. Of course, you get into the discussion about whether or not Jesus is quoting, quoting David and actually saying, you know, uh, you've done to me what this pro what this prophecy said you were going to do to me you know whether it was simply that i i am of the conviction that jesus was suffering to the degree that he felt as if he had been abandoned uh or sure. he felt as if he was alone because of the suffering that he was going through but he knew he was not and, and that's the bottom line and the ultimate point the ultimate point in this is, no matter how I feel, I trust you, God. I I trust in the Father. You know, I, I, I also believe, and I don't fully grasp this, that when Jesus dies, you know, he says, it is finished. And then in Luke, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I believe that he was depending on God, the Father, to raise him from the dead. So it was an act of faith as he was. In other words, he didn't raise himself. God the Father raised him. Well, so that's what know, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us to believe. Yeah. Believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. I mean, from yeah, a, exactly. a strictly doctrinal viewpoint, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, and so I firmly believe. But that's kind of my thoughts on what he's dealing, yeah. what he's saying here. And, and he's making the point all along, you know, you know, uh, the father's always taught me and he's always been with me. And by the way, the father is God. 
that's <laughs> that's the bottom line that he's driving home as he says that. And so, so that's what I see in this. Uh, I, I have not been left alone. I'm not going to be left alone ever. Uh, and that type of a situation. So I guess that's my thoughts. Right. Brendan, Paul, any thoughts on that? Uh, I was just going to add a verse I've always gone to is in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13, where Paul's quoting an early Christian hymn. We're talking about God's faithfulness. He is faithful. Uh, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Mm -hmm. um, and I would amen most of what Tom said. <laughs> no, I everything Tom said, uh, it, it's, you know, the cross was part of the will of God. It is part of the mystery of the atonement. And I mean the mystery in the sense of we, we know the effects mm -hmm. of it. Trying to understand what's all happening in the mind of God. Well, that that's uh, that's a tall order for man to be able yep. to accomplish. But uh, it, it's satisfactory. It's part of God's will. Uh, and again, I think with what Tom's saying there, you read all of Psalm 22. Uh, the psalmist is not actually abandoned by God at the end of that psalm. He is simply expressing his despair and his anguish at the betrayal and so forth. And something that sometimes we don't always recognize is the way people in the first century, even the Bible quotes scripture is a lot different than the way we quote scripture. We tend to be very surgical in our quotation of it um, right. because we have chapter and verses. Oftentimes, you have New Testament writers, when they quote Jeremiah, they're actually splicing three scriptures together. Mm -hmm. And because Jeremiah comes first, that's what they cite. A person can cite, start reciting the first part of a verse and mean the whole, everything that comes after that. And I think that's what you're seeing in, in Jesus' words on the cross is he's referencing the first couple lines of Psalm 22, but he's he's referring to the whole thing. Um, and... And I think yeah. it's really a good point you brought up, John, coming back to here is I always do the things that please him. Um, it pleased all of God right. in a, right. in, for the cross to happen because that was the means by which God had determined to reconcile sinful man to a holy God. Um, and that's Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know, this is, he didn't rejoice in the, in the, and the nailing and the bone, you know, the arms being pulled out of socket and the suffering, he rejoiced in what it was accomplishing. Much like a mother does not rejoice in the pain of childbirth, but rather in what childbirth brings about is the, the birthing of a new new yeah. life. You know, that's that's the idea there. The end result. Yeah, yeah, and and, and just for clarification, Brendan, I, uh, I I agree with you on that point, you know, with verses one and two. I, I, I do believe that Jesus was, I, I think he had Psalm 22 in mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think he did. And, and, and I think the indictment was there, mm -hmm. you know, you know, from that standpoint. But I also think that it was, the suffering was there as oh, yeah. well. And, yeah. and, and, and I think that's the point. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I do. I, yeah. I, I do believe there was a little bit of referencing there, you know, right. and, and those and those religious leaders would have known exactly what he was talking about. So when he when he did that. Paul, any thoughts? I would have a similar understanding of what's already been expressed. But, you know, I've heard good brethren uh, <clears throat> talk about this. And talk about, you know, as Jesus bore the sins on the cross, that uh, sin separates from God and, and that they, they understand this differently. I was going to say that uh, something Brendan said really rung true with me, and that was that to try to say exactly what took place in the mind of God is beyond our, uh, yeah. you know, our understanding. Uh, I find that to be a lot of things when we talk about the Godhead we talk about how God does certain things, uh, how how he understands things that have already, uh, he understands things have already taken place that are yet to happen. Uh, you know, he knows knows what's going to happen. And, and how does that all reconcile itself uh, with our human reasoning? No, I, I'm not there. Um, the, the common phrase is, it's above my pay grade. 
And uh, there's things that we just have to leave to the mind of God and know that yeah. uh, in his mind uh, and, and in his ability that is handled. And it's probably not within human comprehension uh, to just uh, be able to give a perfect explanation of all those things. Yeah. Well, and to Paul, Paul's point there, um, I believe David McClister had a really good lecture. It was at the Truth Lectures a number of years ago. It was when Psalms and the Spiritual Songs came out and the Truth Lectures kind of did the lectureship on various hymns. McClister, I believe, did a lecture on there is a fountain filled with blood talking about the atonement. And he made a really good point that other uh, denominational writers are starting to make. And that is, there is no one picture presented in the Bible about the atonement. And the more God describes something in different ways, the more important it is. And we have a plethora of different images and pictures of what the atonement does for the Christian. It is like a substitution. It is like a ransom. It is like a healing. I mean, you go down that list. And McClister's whole point, I think it's true, is we need to be careful that we don't isolate one view or one picture in the Bible to the neglect of the others because it is such a comprehensive thing. And even all the pictures God gives us, it still probably doesn't adequately convey everything that happens in the mind of God to echo what Paul's making there. Again, it's above my pay grade. I think it's above most people's pay grade. Uh, we're thankful that the atonement happened. We're, we're thankful for the effects and the blessings of the atonement. And uh, just maybe a practical point, since we're talking about this, is just, you know, it's such a marvelous event that God wanted to convey it in dozens of different ways. And so to help us understand, you know, everything that's happening there and that for that, we should be thankful. It's a good point. Good point. All right. So I, I really think that's, that's a good discussion. Um, I've, cause I've heard older preachers in, in a very passionate way of describing the crucifixion of Jesus. They do very good about describing his pain, his suffering, his agony. He was tortured for all intents and purposes. Okay. He was tortured, but then they add to that the idea that, and then on top of all that, God turned his back on Jesus and was separated from Jesus, you know, and, and every time I've heard that, I thought that's hard to, it's hard to accept that that is the way it is. Um, because Jesus, and, and what it is, it does stem from the idea that Jesus took on the guilt of our sins. All right. So some hold that idea. He took on the guilt of our sins. Therefore he was stained and God could not have anything to do with him, but Jesus was a sacrifice for our sins. And, um, but anyway, it's, I think it's important. Jesus had full confidence that God would not leave him alone. Yeah. And, and, and he would know that to be the fact. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts real quick before we go forward? How about from you at home? I haven't really uh, talked to you very much. Been a little bit busy here talking to the other guys here, but if you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to share them with us as well. We'd be more than happy to bring them into our study. And we have touched on a few things a little bit heavier, but I think in the long run, they help us to understand the very life that Jesus lived and what he did for us. Now, in a minute, we're going to pick up with verse 31 and we'll go down to verse 36. I think we can talk about that through the remainder of our time. Um, but any, any other thoughts before we move forward? You know, John, just real quickly on the verse 30, as mm -hmm. he spoke these things, many believed. Exactly. You know, so, yeah. so yes, there were those who didn't, but there were those who did. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's see. Brendan, I think we're back to you on reading. If you would start in verse 31, now let's just go ahead and read to 36, please. Okay, John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say, You will make me free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whomever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, 
but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. When we go back up to verse 31, I've often found this a very interesting phrase because this word abide will be used several times throughout John's writings, um, both here and also, of course, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John as well. The word abide here, let me bring up the definition here for just a moment. Let's see, um, a primary verb to stay, okay? And you'll notice there, I don't know, I don't have it up on screen, sorry. In a given place, state, religion, expectancy, um, and then in broadening the definition to remain or abide. Um, so when he says, if you abide in my word, there's a lot of significance, Brendan, in that phrase, the idea of abiding within the word of God, uh, because that's going to have long ranging results in what we, what the John will later call fellowship with God. Any thoughts on that? I got a lot of thoughts, but I'll try and keep them, keep them brief, but this is, there's current trends right now, and I won't speak to those trends in, mm -hmm. in depth, but there seems to be a growing dissatisfaction or boredom with the Word of God. Uh, okay. Either it's not sufficient or we need something else. Uh, this is leading to some strange and uncertain sounds about the Holy Spirit. And can we know anything? But we should be impressed that throughout all the Gospels, throughout all the Epistles, Old and New Testaments, there is consistent emphasis on abiding in the teaching that God has given. Yeah. And as I was teaching last night, the Spirit's primary agency in which he uses to affect change and growth and spiritual maturity in the life of a believer is the truth of God's Word. Now, for those who at home, do not make don't draw the wrong conclusion that we mean the printed copy. It is the message contained within. And that can come through different channels, through preaching, instruction of parents, the admonition of your elders or brethren, whatever way is the word of God interacts and comes to you. Uh, again, through those, and those are all, we could cite other verses for that. Sure. That, that is how the spirit works. And the more you abide in the word, the more you engage in the things of God through worship and fellowship and reading and prayer and study, the more you're going to see the spirit work in your life. But if you do not abide in the word, if you don't remain there, stay there, plant your feet deep in the word, uh, it's not going to happen. And this is because God's not going to force you against your will to be righteous. Um, Paul, for example, in Galatians around the fourth chapter, talks about how he is in labor again as in a woman in birth pangs until Christ is formed in them. Well, there are Christians. Well, that indicates that there, there's a process that needs to happen. Timothy was told to kindle afresh the gift of God that was in him, and that either could be uh, his ministry or a miraculous measure of the spirit, I really don't think it makes a difference. The point is, Timothy could either encourage spirituality in his life or he could neglect it. And so he had to work at it. And here's here's somebody that we have a letter written to as a preacher, and but he still had to work at it. He still had to kindle afresh that gift. And especially in John's writings, we are told to abide in love abide in the truth, abide in the light, abide in the word. That's where we need to make our home. That's where we need to live. And whether that is through daily Bible reading or Bible listening, some way, shape, or form, engaging with the word of God in whatever ways we can. Like this morning, I didn't have time really to do daily Bible reading, but I do have an app called Dwell, and I'm not sponsored by them. Uh, but I really enjoy it because it's an audio Bible that's easy to navigate. It has my reading plan in it. And so on the mm. days I can't sit down and read, I can click on that and I'm in taking it. And really, for the vast majority of Christian history, that's the primary way Christians engage with the Word of God was by hearing and listening. Um, Romans 10, 17 tells us that. So 
have a lot of thoughts yeah. here, but it boils down to if you want to see spiritual transformation, if you want to see spiritual growth, if you want to feel closest to God, it all comes back to where are you abiding? Are you abiding in God's words, mm -hmm. his people, or are you abiding in the world? Um, some might say it can't be that simple. Well, it is because God made it that simple for us. Simple does not necessarily always mean easy, but it is straightforward. And we have to fight for it sometimes to have that daily time with God. Those are my thoughts there. First John 2, 24, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on that? Like you said, there's a lot more we can say about it. But um, Let's see. I kind of, in reading Tom's mind, I think Tom's concerned that we have seven minutes left. Is that true, Tom? Am I good with that? You know, kind of the it also helps he drops it in our private chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so, yes. Okay. Um let me come back to what we're okay, so this this is um not to miss this point. You are my disciples indeed. Yeah, that's what he says there in verse thirty one. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Again, come back today. You know, we are we are disciples of Christ. You know, using the idea of we are learning from him, we're learning about him. But if his word does not abide in us, then is that a truthful statement on our part? But 32 goes along with that. He makes a statement there then. He says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Um, differentiating his true disciples from even the Pharisees of the day. His word was not abiding in them. They did not accept it. All right, any thoughts, any comments about that? Yeah, uh, of course, the idea of knowing the truth and the truth shall make you free. Again, I think the point that Jesus is making, if you are truly my disciples, you're going to find out. Yeah. You're going to do what is necessary to find out. You're going to investigate. And that's how you're going to know the truth. It's it's not that a drills, the, the, the spiritual drill in your head and it's going to be poured in. It's the idea of you're, you're going to find it. That's right. Kind of goes along with what Jesus said about the reason he taught in parables. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that or not. Sorry. Um, no, no. Oh, there's there's sirens in the background. So um, I hear your melodic well, voice speaking. Why Jesus taught in parables was that there were some things that were to be revealed to the seekers, those who were really wanting to hear and know and obey. And there were other things that for those people who were just curious or just just uh, just kind of along for the ride, they wouldn't get it. And so I think that what Tom said, that kind of goes along with that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'll tell you what, let's plan to make this a good break point for today, verse 33, um, because they're going to get into another question. You know, he talks about, you'll be made free, and they will say, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Uh, forget the days in Egypt. Forget the days in Babylon. <laughs> you know, forget, forget the, the time period of the Rome. judges. Yeah, in Rome, forget exactly. the days in Rome. <laughs> as, yeah. as they're writing it. Um, so we'll we'll start with that uh, next week, verse thirty-three. Um, I'll tell you what happened kind of this morning. Have you ever known of someone who would leave their house for a series of months, maybe longer than that? And then when they come back, there's a problem with the plumbing or maybe mice have shown, chewed through different things like that. I guess that's what my computer decided to do today. I haven't used vMix. I haven't used my stream deck. I haven't done anything here for two months for live streaming purposes. And this morning it was like coughing and sputtering and camera wasn't working and stream decks not working. And so it's like someone going back to your house and having to fix a plumbing issue there. All right. Well, that's enough. It was enough mad said. at you because you left it alone. I guess. I'm telling you what. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, computers have feelings, I guess. You, you, you know, come at home least and that's what AI is about, isn't it? Yeah. Your brand new puppies <laughs> chewed up everything because you yes. left them at home alone. Okay. Well, I appreciate all the participation and comments. We've had very, very few within the chat room, but we do appreciate you being with us. And if you're watching this at a later time and you've got some, you have thoughts that you'd like to share with us, 
you can send them to our email address, questions at truthfactorlive.com. You can also send them to us individually, paul at truthfactor.com, Tom, Brendan, etc. And it should, all things, assuming it still works, will make it to the intended recipient there. Um, but we'd like to hear from you. And if it's possible, we'll bring your thought or your question even into our next study. Okay, well, let's plan then to be back here next Thursday. Um, I don't see anything stopping that. So, Lord willing, we'll be able to be back here. And we'll continue in John chapter 8, verse 33, next 30, Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. All righty. Y'all have a wonderful week. And, gentlemen, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.